Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, certainly thank you, Senator, for inviting me to be here today and being amongst uh, so many friends. Let me tell you a quick story. Uh, some of you will think I'm crazy, but I like to drive, and I actually drove up here from Houston over the last two days. Yesterday, I was driving across Wyoming, and of course, there's only one radio station, I think, in Wyoming, that's K2 in Casper, and they played a, uh, an ad or a, a piece on the radio several times during the day highlighting this conference. Uh, and I tell you that story because I think it's, it's awfully important for you to realize what a leadership role Montana plays, not only in this country, but certainly in this region that states like uh, Wyoming, states like North Dakota certainly look like, uh, look to Montana for leadership because you all share s many of the same issues. And uh, certainly Montana, I think, can play a huge leadership role here in the West and throughout the country. Let me start by, uh, by playing the quick video clip for you, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it. Can I go ahead and play the, the clip? What Cobalt's all about is a team of specialists. What we need is people that we can simply bring on board and they want to have an impact. When I came to Cobalt, the first project they put me on, I walk in the door, day two, you're going to drill the next one. Permit is submitted, it's not approved, we finalize and make it happen, it's happening next, right? It's like, okay, great. I'm going pressure to over 30,000 PSI, so extreme pressures. That is the equivalent of looking out of a plane window and trying to line up a bunch of straws to put through a basketball hoop on the ground. We were able to execute that to 36,552 feet, which is still currently the record. That well was designed and executed by Montana Tech graduates. They're both incredibly technical, they're highly skilled, highly trained. The education that I, I had at Montana Tech really did give me uh, more insights into what it's like to actually do the work. We had professors that had actual work experience. That makes a real key difference. It's very difficult to teach drilling engineering from a textbook, and they recognize that. Montana Tech graduates are certainly some of the very best people that I've had the chance to work with. Well, thank you very much. Who would have uh, guessed that Montana Tech would be the epicenter of deep water drilling technology? Uh, that's, that's what it is today. Uh, many, many Montana Tech grads uh, exist in the industry today throughout Houston. It's, uh, it's almost little Montana down there. But anyway, we are certainly grateful for the uh, association we have with Montana Tech. But let me jump into a few thoughts that I have, maybe not just on deep water oil and gas business, but the energy business uh, in general. Uh, you know, there's probably not two things in the world I like talking about more than, than energy. I've spent my whole life in it and Montana, so uh, the opportunity here this morning to talk about both of those things at the same time is quite an honor. And again, thank you, Senator, for, for inviting me today. It is a great pleasure to be here in the great state of Montana. While my main residence is in Houston, Texas, uh, I consider Montana to be my home state, uh, or at least my second home state. In fact, I started my career uh, nearly 40 years ago, uh, just down the road in Powell, Wyoming, when I worked for Amico Production Company. I grew to love the great state of Montana at that time, and my family now spends as much time as we can in our home in Whitefish. And while Montana has some of the most beautiful landscapes in the country, it's the people of Montana that make this place very, very special. In fact, when I first met uh, Senator Daines in Washington a year or so ago, we spent most of our time talking about the people of Montana uh, and not its other natural resources. Senator Dane's concern for the people of Montana, I think, came through loud and clear this morning in his prepared comments, and that energy is certainly central to all of those, uh, the future well-being of Montana residents as well as, I think, people around the world. Uh, Montana, like Texas, is fortunate in that it is a state that's rich in natural resources, including coal, oil, hydro, wind, solar, biomass, and of course, of course most important to all of that is the people. Let's be clear, uh, access to all forms of energy plays an important role in every aspect of our lives. 
Over the next few days, we'll have the opportunity to engage in a rich discourse that boils down to one fundamental question. If we choose to live in a world that continues to consume more energy, how do we produce it more efficiently and more responsibly so that our growing consumption promotes human development and makes every aspect of our lives and our planet better? Let's start by considering that our sources of energy have and will continue to change. This has been a universal phenomenon for as long as man has inhabited the earth. Millions of years ago, the human race relied on collecting and using combustible materials to generate fire which provided the very basic yet necessary form of energy and the means of survival. Today, with a marked increase in global energy consumption and our understanding that access to energy provides a dramatically better way of life, we look to diversified sources of energy such as coal, oil, gas, hydro, nuclear, and other renewable and biodegradable resources to fill our worldwide energy demand. As a matter of fact, the ability to convert energy content that's contained in the raw fuels into useful work is, in my opinion, the distinguishing factor of the human race. Looking into the future and considering our world in 30 to 50 years, it's hard to imagine any scenario we will, where we will not use more of these resources to meet our increasing energy demand. With the direct correlation between energy use, education, quality of life, economic growth, our focus needs to be on how we become more innovative and efficient at producing energy to meet the growing demand and sustain and improve society's general well-being. As we move through these next few days, let's embark on conversations related to the local, national, and global outlook for energy, as well as the market, infrastructure, development, and emerging research and innovation required to produce it safely and efficiently. Throughout these discussions, we will create the opportunity to describe the continuing role that energy plays for our current and future environment. As we know, energy consumption is dictated by the law of supply and demand. According to a recent study by Wood McKenzie, over the past 20 years, global energy demand has increased on average of about 2% a year. This increased demand was driven largely by the industrialization of countries like China and India. Predictions now indicate that global energy demand growth will experience a slowdown over the next 30 years or so to about 1% a year. That being said, it's important to understand that even with a slower anticipated growth in the future, energy suppliers have an enormous challenge ahead to meet this cumulative 50% increase in growth in energy global demand. This demand growth can only be met with continued access to and ability to efficiently produce this needed energy by utilizing our rich <coughs> natural resources safely and environmentally re in responsible ways. Considering the basic laws of thermodynamics, we know we cannot get something for nothing. Therefore, it stands to reason that the predicted demand growth over the coming decades will require both higher efficiency in our energy use and more efficient and economic energy production. How can this be accomplished? Through technology, which I believe is the key to answering both sides of that equation. We must recognize the significant and continually innovative role that technology plays in becoming increasingly efficient in energy production and its use. And just as importantly, we must create forward-looking policies and incentives that allow industry to be the great innovators it always has been and the trendsetters that it always has been and which places the consumers, academia, government, and industry on the same side of these problems to successfully move forward and meet this increased energy demand. We must also understand that access to more energy means the opportunity for increased economic growth. It's a fact of life. Big economies require lots of energy. Economic growth gives way to increased jobs and education and quality of life, and this trend results in more opportunity, which means more need for energy. It's a successful do loop that man has been on for millions of years. At the heart of it all, I think, lies the innate human spirit of challenge. We are driven to create a better world for our children and all future generations. 
while better understanding and protecting this magnificent planet with which we have been blessed. The spirit of uh, ingenuity and advancement remains as strong today as it was for Captain Lewis and Captain Clark and their crew of nearly 40 adventurers who embarked on a journey of discovery over two centuries ago. Of course, I'm speaking of the Lewis and Clark expedition, which departed from near St. Louis on May 14, 1804. 212 years ago, the core discovery embarked on a journey that ranks among the most consequential human undertakings of all time. Their energy production, which propelled them on this journey, was directly related to how much food they consumed. It allowed them to journey across the Louisiana Territory, which included traversing this great state of Montana over about 330 river miles over a course of many months. Uh, in fact, I find it particularly meaningful that we are meeting today a very short walk from where Captain Clark traveled as, as he made his way back down the magnificent Yellowstone River on his way back from the Pacific Ocean. The core discovery story illustrates how the innate human spirit of challenge and the unending quest for innovation have always driven and continue to drive uh, better solutions to find the problems that man faces and create a better tomorrow. Today's volatile commodity prices and economic headwinds do present enormous challenge. However, I am confident that we in the industry who produce the various forms of energy can and will overcome these trials and emerge stronger and more resilient. We will do so through free enterprise, collaboration, evolving technology, and balancing economic and personal growth with the impacts to health and our environment. I think that the media, among others, are correct to continually challenge us to find ways to produce energy that are more efficient and have a diminishing impact on the world in which we share with 7.4 billion people. Yet many in this country and in the developed world take energy, that simple six-letter word for granted. We allow for conversations that describe energy in mainly negative context. Air pollution caused by fossil fuels, potential water pollution caused by fracking, oil pollution caused by the inexcusable Macondo disaster. Yet somehow we overlook the story that tells of innovation, promise, and a better life. The one thing about how we continue to strive to turn energy into resources, into useful work, and products that makes our lives better and has less impact on the environment. This is a story where the United States has and will continue to lead through innovation, not regulation, and how energy provides means to convert raw materials into jobs, products, food, education, and a better future for all of us. After all, let us always remember that by producing the most abundant, affordable, reliable energy in the world, the energy industry makes every other direct and indirect industry more productive. At a basic level, energy is the essential uh, ingredient in building our homes, purifying water, producing food, generating heat and air conditioning, irrigating deserts, building hospitals, producing clothing and manufacturing pharmaceuticals. We in the industry have been remiss in not talking enough about these essential benefits of energy that makes all of this possible. Moving from the days of Lewis and Clark, it's almost impossible to believe that we were able to land a man on the moon a mere century and a half later. But then again, only 60 years ago, it was considered groundbreaking to drill offshore wells in 10 to 15 feet of water to very shallow subsurface depths. And it's only been within the last 20 years or so that technology has evolved to the point where drilling offshore wells in water depths as deep as 10,000 feet to well depths over 35,000 feet has become commonplace. That's essentially drilling wells over six miles deep in two miles of water. And we're doing so with a concerted focus on reducing our environmental footprint by improving the efficiencies and evolving technologies to continually minimize risks. In December of last year, the United, States, uh, United Nations Environment Program and Climate Action brought industry, government, and public bodies together during the 2015 Parrot Climate Conference with the aim of achieving a universal agreement uh, 
on the actions that are still needed to reduce carbon emissions and greenhouse gases and keep global warming below 2% or 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, my, uh, my personal opinion is I think we spent far too much time uh, talking about global warming and CO2 emissions. I think what we should be talking about is all emissions and all pollutants and how to reduce all of them to make this world a better place. I've yet to meet anyone in my life who really desires to be a polluter. Uh, I know that doesn't exist in the energy industry and I doubt that it in exists in society in general. But we can't let the conversation stop there or end when we leave this conference in a few days. We have to carry the discourse forward to tell the rest of the story about how innovation, evolving technology, and continuing dialogue can and will solve many of our challenges. Let's briefly discuss the deep water oil and gas environment, which you saw uh, some examples on the, the video clip earlier. The evolution of technology has enabled deep, deep water operators like Cobalt to explore and drill deeper than ever imagined even 30 years ago when operators first started drilling deep water prospects in the Gulf of Mexico. Last year we celebrated Cobalt's 10th anniversary. When we founded Cobalt with the vision of being one of the world's most admired exploration and production companies, our focus was on people and technology because success in the energy business is related to the aggressive use of technology and data by great human talent. In Cobalt's case, that technology includes implementation of seismic processing and interpretation, software modeling, drilling technology, and downhole monitoring techniques. But technology doesn't come cheap. Cobalt has invested over $420 million in strategically acquiring data and technology across our deep water Gulf of Mexico acreage positions, as well as our positions in West Africa. Three-dimensional seismic surveys allow us to image below salt, including uh, everything we need to know about rocks that exist six to seven miles below the Earth's surface, the porosity of those rocks, the geologic structures that they contain. The application of improved imaging of the seismic data allows explorers, like cobalt, to better understand the subsurface geology, engineer those wells, and conduct operations in a way that reduces the geologic and environmental risks and minimizes our exploration footprint. Today we have the ability to access our exploration well data on a real-time basis from our smartphones from anywhere in the world at any time through continuous monitoring. This means that we can receive this real-time innov innov innovative information any place in the world at any time regardless of where our operations take place. This capability was inconceivable when I started my career down the road in Powell. In fact, I've witnessed the expansion of technology in all aspects of the energy business and growth in ways that even a few years ago I would have thought were unimaginable. In the onshore oil and gas sector, enhanced oil recovery technology is being used to increase the amount of oil that can be produced from mature uh, reservoirs. Of course, the advancements uh, made in both horizontal drilling and fracturing technology have propelled an astonishing growth in both oil and gas production. Carbon dioxide injection is being used to stimulate oil production from enhanced oil recovery projects while at the same time minimizing carbon dioxide uh, emissions to the atmosphere. And because of the advancements of companies like Shell, uh, major advancements have been made in temporary facilities that capture methane gas to minimize the flaring from wells during testing operations. Change has evolved with innovation and the employment of emerging technology, there's no doubt. However, these technological advances were not developed with a leave it in the ground approach. Instead, they emerged because someone saw a need or an opportunity. Essentially, these modern day trailblazers are a lot like Lewis and Clark in that they have an insatiable curiosity to find a better mousetrap through innovation and efficiency to conquer new challenges. This is exactly the attitude we need to continue to move forward. I firmly believe that innovation requires collaboration among private industry, academia, and government. We must consider how we implement a multilateral approach to create an ecosystem where industry, government, and academia jointly drive innovation and foster greater technological advancements which can power the world into the future.
I started this talk by asking us to consider how we can produce energy more efficiently and responsibly, and so our use promotes human development and makes every aspect of our lives better. I would venture to say that over the past few years, we've been moving increasingly that direction at a fast pace. We now see energy efficiency everywhere, from our high efficiency washing machines to our longer lasting light bulbs, uh, our increased education about energy conservation. I think all of us are starting to take personal responsibility and ownership for the global energy demand. Yet, hardly a day goes by where there is not an article or an assertion that one energy source is slated to overtake another and be the answer to all of our problems. That it will corner the market share and provide a one-size-fits-all solution to make our lives better while having less impact on the environment. As an example, I recently read an article that stated natural gas will provide about one-third of the electricity generation in 2016 while coal's share will drop into the low 30% range. This is despite coal having a significant role in that it generated about half of the United States power generation uh, between 2000 and 2008. Uh, no doubt that the uh, fracking boom in natural gas has played a big role in making more volumes of natural gas available, which has had an impact on the coal's use, but the fact is that coal is not going away. When considering all the opportunities that our exceptional energy resources provide in this country and our personal and professional responsibilities to produce, uh, reduce consumption, I believe that we must recognize the entire slate of natural and renewable energy resources, including coal, oil, gas, hydroelectric, nu uh, nuclear, and other renewable and biodegradable energy sources to supply the future demand. They all have a purpose and they all can be part and must be part of the solution to meet this vastly improved, uh, increased energy demand. Coal, which has traditionally been utilized by industrialized countries for uh, power generation, is losing footing because these economies are shifting to different sources of fuel. However, with the development of clean coal technology that the senator mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we can revive the coal industry which can use carbon capture of one form or another, and which makes coal the ideal source, not only in our past, but in our future, for baseload power generation. States like Montana, which has the fourth largest domestic market share for coal, can lead this technology drive forward, lowering the CO2 emissions capture and ensuring uh, local industry's future. Natural gas, which is primarily used to fuel electricity generation and heating, is expensive, it's inexpensive, and there's an abundance, almost inexhaustible supply of it with the advances in fracking. However, with concerns still out there regarding uh, increased greenhouse gases, there is a need to explore in environmental, te uh, techno environmental technology that will allow even increased uses of natural gas. Nuclear and hydro sources uh, currently make up the majority of non-fossil fuel energy supply. Yet, despite nuclear's promise, uh, consumers are becoming more and more concerned about nuclear's future. Renewables are coming more cost-efficient alternative, but it would require creating the technology and capacity to store produced energy, which can often be intermittent to make that technology pervasive. Nevertheless, it's quite possible that over the next 20 years, 20% 20 of global energy output could come from renewables such as solar and wind energy uh, with increased and improved battery efficiency. While one might argue that we need to focus on only one or two energy resources, I would argue that they all have a place in the global energy mix and they all involve some trade-offs. For example, Wood McKinsey uh, recently uh, predicted that uh, fossil fuel supply uh, natural gas among fossil fuels plays natural gas will see the largest growth and non-fossil fuels will see the fastest growth by 2035 40 to 50 percent of global power output will come from hydro nuclear solar wind and biomass however the vast majority of this output will still come from hydro and nuclear at the same time global demand for oil according to wood mckinsey will decline over the course of the next two decades. This is very problematic 
in that with an anticipated increase of 50% in global energy demand, a decline in oil must be accommodated by some other form of equivalent energy. And, and so a hydro, solar, and wind, and biomass do just not have the functionality uh, or energy content to fill the gaps that the lack of oil would create. In fact, with the exception of nuclear energy, oil is the most powerful energy source we've ever come across, and we are still and going to be heavily dependent upon it. There is just no technology on the horizon that is slated to replace, replace the oil-based fuels that we rely on for everyday needs, including agriculture, textiles, manufacturing, and of course, various modes of transportation. The advances in non-oil use transportation alternatives, such as natural gas vehicles and electric uh, vehicles, just doesn't fit what could become uh, our global need and could create a global transportation crisis. In fact, their combined use will still only deliver about 10% of the global transportation demand in 2035, and even that 10% will remain limited uh, due to the transportation requirements in terms of travel distance and refueling. So realistically, there are no uh, viable or competitive economic solutions to the fossil fuel industry that we rely on today to fuel air, uh, rail, and transportation that keeps our global economy moving. Therefore, it stands to reason that our ability to continue this way of life will require a multilateral approach to policy, production, and consumption. As I've said, there's a tremendous need for the continuing of technological development. Government plays a key role in creating the ecosystem where industry can invent the technologies that are needed to make each of these energy resources more viable and useful. It is our industry's desire to be a part of a comprehensive solution to meet the needs of the global energy demand but we can only do so by testing emergent technologies in a responsible and safe manner. However, policies that remove the opportunity for advancement, such as not opening the East Coast for drilling, take away the incentive for innovation and progress. How many of you are aware that there's one country in the world that leads the pack in limiting access to offshore energy resources by a long, long way? That country, unfortunately, is the United States of America. As we start to implement a multilateral approach and we create the ecosystem to foster greater technological advancement, we must not forget the ongoing need for talent. We need to work together and come up with solutions that attract the next generation to continue what we've started. The Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts a strong demand in the engineering field over the next 10 years Yet in the in energy industry, there's a significant number, uh, number of people that are facing retirement in the same period of time. The energy industry must continue to work to attract the younger generation into energy-related professions and make long-term plans based on known energy labor trends. We need to consider uh, projected labor force statistics and look to labor organizations like the AFL-CIO and similar organizations for their active involvement in recruiting the talent we need for this energy to succeed, industry to succeed. We need to aggressively pursue and prioritize getting students interested in marketing programs that are currently in place, uh, such as Montana Tech, you saw some of that earlier. Uh, their programs in geology, geophysical, and engineering are second to none. The University of Montana's uh, Oil and gas law programs are very important and a key part of our future. We need to help students understand the scope and available, available pathways that will re prepare them for long and rewarding careers in the energy industry and lead to further improvements and refinement of these technologies required. And we need to keep organizations like the Montana Petroleum Association and the American Petroleum Institute actively involved in training, driving policy issues, and helping solve energy-related regulatory hurdles so that we can continue to see Montana and our nation grow as leaders in the global energy marketplace. So where do we go from here? Well, I think it's really up to us. As I consider what the world will look like for our grandchildren, I realize it's our choice to make. We must uh, collectively work towards producing a more abundant, 
supply of clean, efficient, reliable, and affordable energy by finding an efficient, streamlined way to produce natural resources as we have been blessed with in this country and in this state. Those, of course, include coal, liquid hydrocarbon, and natural gas, and combine these with nuclear battery technology and other forms of renewables. We must become more efficient and use less energy per unit of work so our energy supply goes further. And we must continue to keep the lines of communication open among industry, academia, and government. So as you consider these points over the next few days and sit on some spectacular panels that are planned, consider how you want to engage in a conversation so that we can work together and create tomorrow's opportunities just like Captain Clark did on this same hallowed ground a little over 200 years ago. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take a few questions if, uh, if you have any. Can't really see if, can't really see if there's any questions, so. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll be around the rest of the morning. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, as we, we see each other in the hall a bit later. And again, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to be back in uh, this great state of Montana. Thank you. Well, thanks, Joe. What a great way to start the morning. And I love the, uh, the video to see those Montana Tech students from places like Shoto, do you see that, and Cut Bank who are on the cutting edge and uh, the illustration of being in an airplane at 30,000 feet and taking a straw and drilling and hitting the ground there in terms of uh, illustrating what it takes in these uh, deep offshore drilling operations. Very proud of uh, what's going on with those Montanans who are down in, in Houston. And I also was struck too by Joe's comments about the importance of getting industry, academia, and government on the same page. And we certainly have that mix here today of leaders from, from all three of those important functions so we continue to talk about the future of, uh, of energy in this country. Well, it's now my privilege to introduce to you Matt Rose. Uh, Matt is the executive chairman of BNSF Railway. You know, like a lot of Montana kids, you remember a Christmas morning opening up that package and you find that electric train set under the tree. I think Matt Rose gets to play with real trains every day. He's seen firsthand how technology has shaped the rail transportation industry in Montana. But Matt actually began his career in the trucking industry. He joined BNSF in 1993 when it was at that time just Burlington Northern Railroad. And since then he served in numerous leadership roles in the company, 13 years as chief executive officer and 11 years as chairman of BNSF. Technology has the potential to reduce energy costs, increase safety, thereby making energy more accessible and reliable. We know here in Montana, given that we are a long ways from a lot, of, a lot of major population centers, we depend heavily on good infrastructure and the rail industry. Matt offers a unique voice to not only the challenges facing our nation's transportation infrastructure, but the important role that technology is playing in shaping our nation's transportation future. Please give a warm welcome to Matt Rose. <laughs> 